So these are the results that we took for the water that was being heated. We had a mass of 0 0.227 kilograms. We had these values for the voltage and current. Now they did fluctuate slightly, but these are the values that I chose when I looked at the data. Um, and then we had the time in seconds and also the temperature to the nearest one degree. Sometimes that's a bit tricky, but these are the values I took by my judgment about if it is nearer to whichever value it might be. Now the first thing we, we're gonna do is work out the power. Now the power transferred is equal to the voltage or the potential difference multiplied by the current. So in this case here, it's gonna be equal to 9.58 multiplied by 3.39. Okay, so they're the values that we took. And if we work this out, this was equal to 32.5 watts. Okay, so I'm just giving that to um, this value down here. Now to look at the energy transferred, the energy transferred is going to be equal to the power multiplied by the time. So we're going to use this power here multiplied by this time over here. So when the time is zero, the energy transferred is zero. When the time is 60 seconds, we're going to take 32.5 multiplied by 60, which is equal to 1950 joules. And we're just going to continue this for the rest of the table. So now we've got our values that go up to about 20,000 joules and we're gonna plot this on the x-axis and on the y-axis we're gonna have the temperature going from 11 to 32 degrees. So I've gone from 10 up to 35 degrees here for my temperature and energy going from zero up to 20,000 joules. So I can now start to plot my data. So this is the data that we took and there seemed to be definitely a bit of a jump here when we went from sort of uh, sort of 12 degrees here up to about 18 and I suppose that might be due to the mixing of the water and how um, how evenly that water is actually being mixed. Anyway, um, I think looking at this data here, um, probably the best line of best fit is going to be something like this. Okay, so looking at this data, I think that here we have a good set of data. So I'm going to use this line here to actually work out the gradient. So to work out the gradient, I'm just going to draw a triangle onto this. So I'm just going to go across here, up to here like that. Now I'm just going to put on some of the points that we have. So over here we have a value of about uh, 3200 uh, on the energy and the temperature here is going to be midway between 15 and 20 because it's on this line, so that's 17. Point five, So that's the coordinates for this point. This point up here, uh, the energy is 20,000 and the temperature again is midway between 30 and 55, so that's 32.5. Okay, so to work out the gradient, the gradient is going to be equal to the change in y divided by the change in x value, so that's going to be equal to 32.5 take away 17.5 which is equal to 15 and we're going to divide this by the change in temperature which goes from 20,000 down to 3,200 so that's 16,800 and when I work this out this gives a value equal to 0 0.000, .000 eight nine three okay so we've got a value for the gradient now the equation says that the energy transferred is equal to mc delta theta and that means c the specific heat capacity is equal to the change in energy divided by m delta theta now when we worked out the gradient it was our change in temperature divided by the energy and that means we can use our value for the gradient into this equation over here to say the specific heat capacity is equal to 1 divided by the mass multiplied by the gradient that we've just worked out. Okay, so if we actually kind of do some rearranging, this is the equation we can come up with. So here, the specific heat capacity of water is going to be 1 divided by the mass, and the mass was 0 0.227, and the gradient value here was 0 0.000893. So when we do that on the calculator, I've still got this uh, value here saved. So I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.227, 
and then we're going to do 1 divided by this, and this gives a value of 4933.9. Now, that's a lot of significant figures. Um, in reality, because we could only measure the temperature to the nearest 1 degree, our temperature data is to two significant figures, and that means we can say the specific heat capacity of water to two significant figures is 4,900. And the units are, because we've got energy divided by mass times change in temperature, joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So this was the value that we got. Now, that's good, but it's a bit higher than the real value. The real value for water is about 4,180 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So the answer that we got was even higher. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It might be that when we had this heater, it wasn't fully submerged in the water. So although we were supplying lots of energy, some of that energy wasn't actually heating up the water. But also, we didn't actually insulate the beaker that the water was in. So maybe as we were supplying lots of energy, it was heating up the room as well. And we could get around that by perhaps in the future, uh, maybe having a lid um, which is insulated on top. We could insulate the size of the beaker and insulate underneath it to reduce any heat loss. But because we had a lot of that um, extra energy going to supply uh, heat and thermal energy to the surroundings, that's why we got a higher value than the accepted value. So. That was my analysis of the data. Um, you might have had different values when it came to maybe recording the temperature at different times, but we'd have got a graph similar to this. Um, and I think maybe these pot plots down here at the very bottom were maybe slightly anomalous. But looking at this data here, I think a good straight line went through the data like that. It gave this value for the gradient, and that meant we got a value of about 4,900 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, which is actually a lot higher than we get for metals like the aluminium that we also tested. So that one there is my analysis of some data for the specific heat capacity of water.